Theology of Jesus in our Christmas Eve service. I want to invite you guys to those services. Bring someone, a friend, family that's come in with you, whatever it is, whatever it looks like in your world right now. Bring yourself for sure. Don't just invite someone else and drop them off. You come too. Um, but, uh, but we want to invite you to Christmas Eve especially. You just can't, it's not a, not a service you really want to miss. It's a wonderful time together. Um, and it's kind of the culmination of, of anticipation and all of that. And then on Sunday morning, we, uh, we don't always get to celebrate Christmas Day. And if you have the ability and you want to bring your family in for that, we invite you to come for that. We'll, t- we'll talk about what Christmas Day means in terms of arrival and all of, all of the uh, all that surrounds that. But today I want to uh, just invite you into really kind of the last part uh, of this of this uh, Christmas story as it pertains to Joseph and, and, and how, how he, as the Bible tells us, accepts Jesus as his son and what needs to happen in order to do that. So if you're online, welcome. If you're here in person, we're glad you're here, especially if you're a guest or visitor with us. Um, Preparing for newborns is, is no small task, right? You're preparing in your heart, you're preparing in your home. Uh, for every, every child that you've had, if you've had children, it's different, right? Uh, I, I know that the, the first children that Holly and I prepared for were actually two young boys from Brazil. After we left Brazil, we wanted to adopt these two boys from an orphanage. And uh, we went through this whole process of home studies and purchasing backpacks and clothes and, a, you know, getting uh, bunk beds set up. And, and we just enjoyed so much this process, fundraising and just asking people if they partner with us in this. That kind of stuff, it, it was just all a, a preparation. It was a sum total of, of all of these things that we had planned for. Unfortunately for us in that moment, um, we began to grieve because we found out that like, men, like us, there were... Uh, half a dozen to a dozen couples that weren't getting past um, a certain, certain spot in the adoption process with Brazil, and it never happened. It, it affected how we prepared for our second child. Our first child, though, uh, that, we, that, that, that Holly gave birth to, Caroline, we, we did all of the stuff, right? You, <laughs> you prepare the room, I painted, we put things up, we knew it was a girl, and so it all, you know what I mean? You just, you begin to prepare, but... Holly and I, we prepared differently in all of that. We, we, we pre- I prepared as a father, thinking about what it would be like to have uh, my, my first uh, child, and that being a girl, and man, what am I going to do? I don't, know, I don't know women that well. Like All of those kinds of things. It, guys, amen, right? Amen. Like, I, I don't know what to do with this. So there was a, there was a guy, uh, his wife was pregnant with their first child, they had an early doctor's appointment. They went to the OBGYN, and he mentioned that he was looking forward to the next appointment where uh, they were going to have the big ultrasound, right? Like he, and, and he wanted to find out the gender of the baby, and so he's so excited. And the doctor said, I can do that right now if you'd like. And on a quick scan, he says, I think you're having a girl. And so he was so excited, even though he was in seminary and working full-time, he went home and made a, a name plaque for his daughter and his wife uh, being... Uh, I don't think she was being a contrarian here, but just being probably more wise than him said, you know, I wonder if this is the best use of your time. What if the doctor's wrong? And he says, well, I guess I'll have to do it all again. <laughs> but I think he's right. We, we just prepare in our hearts. We, we prepare differently, definitely. Um, I remember preparing for, Cara, for Lindley, excuse me, and after... The combination of those two experiences from preparing and not receiving to preparing and receiving and how both of those things worked, knowing that Lindley is adopted and so we are working with this whole idea of adoption and how it didn't work before and but we've had a girl before and so this one's here so there's not the but you 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 prepare differently and we did we we did I remember I remember putting the crib together the day that she came home that's how that's how little we were going to be invested just in case you know what I mean so we all prepare for newborns differently and experiences call for that as well. And Joseph, he was no different. He, he began to prepare for this in a different kind of way when he heard the news. Um, but but here's, here's the thing we want to see. Joseph and Mary and Abraham and David, and then as a result, the whole world was promised a son. 
It wasn't just a promise to Mary. It was a promise to Joseph, and it hit him differently. The, the promise was to Abraham, that he'd be the father of, uh, of this nation that, that, would, that, would, that would be a blessing to all people. And David, he would find that out of his lineage, there would come the Messiah, and the whole world as a result was going to be the beneficiary of this son. Everyone was promised a son. And if you think about it, in the arrival of Jesus, this was the culmination of so many promises. And if you look in Matthew chapter 1 and you begin to read verse, in verse 18, which we're going to do here in just a second, you're going, you're going to see how this kind of hit Joseph, how, how, how he began to deal with it. And he was kind of the, the final piece here that needed to be brought into place in order for all of this uh, to happen the way God intended it to happen. If you read with me and follow along at verse 18, he says, This is how the birth of Jesus the Messiah came about. His mother Mary was pledged to be married to Joseph. But before they came together, she was found to be pregnant through the Holy Spirit. Because Joseph, because Joseph, her husband, was faithful to the law and yet did not want to expose her to public disgrace. So, in other words, he, he knows the law and, he's, and he's, he's devout, right? But there's this contrast of loving Mary and not wanting to bring disgrace to her. And he's trying to figure out how to do this. So the next line is what he figured, okay? Uh, he, it says he did not want to expose her to public disgrace. He had in mind to divorce her quietly. Verse 20, but after he had considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife, because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. Now, if I'm Joseph, I'm like, how does this make anything better? Right? Like, you think about it, like, the, how, how does that help me right now? Like, his mind is already swirling. He's trying to develop a plan. And an angel comes in a dream and says, it's all good. The Holy Spirit did it. Well, great, right? Like, can you imagine yourself in that position? That would have been, I'm not sure if that would have been settling news for his heart. And, and yet he had to begin to deal with that. It says, it says that uh, he goes on, the angel does, to say, she will give birth to a son. Oh, it's a, it's a boy. And you already give him the name Jesus. And here's why. Because he will save his people from their sins. Verse 22, all this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. Did we lose my mic? Am I, are you guys still hearing me okay? Yeah. Okay, I just, it just started kind of messing with me. I apologize. When Joseph woke up, he did what the angel of the Lord had commanded him and took Mary home as his wife, but he did not consummate their marriage until he gave birth, she gave birth to a son. Uh, there we go. And he gave him the name Jesus. Sorry about that. I, I really liked this ending verse here. The, actually, the, the last couple verses combined when, jo when Joseph woke up. So you got it. You gotta understand. Have you ever been? Have you ever been in a dream and it felt really real? You woke up and you go, "Was it real though?" Okay, no, it wasn't real. This is reality, right? Well, can you imagine for him? He was like, "No, that was real." I think I have to. I think I have to do something about this. And he had to go from a, a dream state of hearing this news to a, an opportunity to decide if this was going to be real. I have to do something about it. I'm gonna have to change my mind here. And so he's, it says that he did what the angel of the Lord had commanded him and took Mary home as his wife, and then he gave him the name Jesus. He had to do all of it. It was customary for the father to give the son a name, and he had it just been handed it on a silver platter. And he, but he had to obey. So all of them, Mary, Joseph, Abraham, David, we've talked about all these people. The whole world was promised a son. So let's start with Joseph. Number one, Joseph is promised a son. Mary's pregnant. The child is not Joseph's. An angel appears in a dream. And at most, Joseph will be an adoptive father at this point. That's what he finds out. That's not a, that's not a bad gig, by the way, to be an adoptive father. But, but he's recognizing this is not mine and I have to make a choice now. The child will be a son. I'll be an adoptive father to a boy. Uh, I've heard of modern day versions of this, uh, of this kind of visit, right? Where you, you're, you're visited in a dream uh, uh, by Jesus. But, but the emphasis here is, is not on that, 
the, the dream part of it, but on the, on the preparation. He was preparing Joseph for a really big decision. You're going to have a promise. Here, here's the promise. I promise this will come true. And sometimes we face difficult times. Sometimes we face really, really hard announcements in our lives, don't we? Think about this from Joseph's point of view. He, he, he's already faced with, how do I handle this lady with dignity, who I thought I was going to marry and we were going to have a family. Now I find out she's pregnant and it's not mine. And I obey the law, and how do I obey the law and do this? And so he's already making his mind up to do that. That was probably hard enough, right? Then he gets visited in a dream and says, you're right, it's not yours. The Holy Spirit did this. Now give him this name. And like, how many men would feel out of control in that moment? <laughs> how many men would feel like, I, I have no choice in the matter? He, he was faced with a difficult announcement. I, I know, and, and you know, sometimes I, I kind of begin to liken this to, to those that I've known or I've heard of who, who are having a kind of a, I don't hate to even say it like this, but that's, this is kind of the term, kind of an oops child. And, you know, like, oh my, what am I going to do? I didn't realize this was going to happen. I'm, I'm older and I didn't know this was, you know what I mean? So you can begin to go through like this understanding of like, oh, I, we weren't p prepared for this. He wasn't prepared for this. He probably had a plan of how his family was going to go. And sometimes we face really difficult times, difficult announcements that change our future. This is a future-changing moment in his life. Joni Erickson Tata, she, she had a future-changing moment. And as she, as she jumped into the shallow water in the Chesapeake, she, she, she hit her head, cracking her neck, making her a quadriplegic. And at one point, with the shades drawn and the AC on and everyone leaving her alone in her depression, she said to God, God, if I can't die, show me how to live. Because she was faced with that moment, that difficult time in her life. And many of us, we don't get to that place. I hope you do when you're faced with a challenge or a difficult announcement in your life that you eventually go to the Lord and say, God, how would you help me through this? Not I'm going to give up, not I'm, I'm going to do this on my own, I'm just going to you know, pull myself up by the bootstraps here, or I'm just going to give up. Hopefully none of those things. We all think those things, right? We're human beings, like Joseph was. But when you're faced with a difficult decision, when you're faced with a difficult announcement, when something's going to change your future, and you don't feel like you have control, where do you go? It's like, it's like when, <laughs> this is the funnier version, you guys like Ebenezer Scrooge? You guys remember the story in here? He's visited by ghosts. But, 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 the, but the sum moral of that, of that story was sometimes the best lessons learned come from our mistakes and our failures. And he saw the mistakes he'd made in his lifetime up till then and vowed not to repeat them in the future. What are you, you going to do when something comes your way that you have no control of? And it affects your future. How are you going to work through that? That's where we find Joseph. Sometimes a difficult situation is something that is being worked through in your life to give you exactly what God wants in you and through you. He wants you to become something, and He is okay with allowing you to walk through some things that are difficult in order to bring you to a place where He wants you to be. James 1, 2 through 4 is a good reminder of this very reality. Consider it pure joy. Where does pure joy come from in circumstances where you're faced with many kinds of trials? It's in the trials. Consider it pure joy, my, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith, these trials, what does it produce? Perseverance. Now, this next line to me is where we sometimes give up too soon. Let perseverance finish its work. Say that with me. Let perseverance finish its work. Now, I'm not, I, I, I don't have any doubt that what, what God the Father did through the Holy Spirit to conceive a child that was going to be the Messiah would have come about. But I also wonder sometimes, what if Joseph had not let Perseverance finishes work. 
Would he have grown up with the dad that he was, that, 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 that the angel was promising he would be? Would Jesus have had the same kind of family? I don't know. Maybe God would have, this is the Messiah. Maybe he would have just made that happen no matter what. But you wonder sometimes, right? And in our lives, how many times have you stopped short of letting perseverance finish its work? The tests, the announcements, the conflicts, the hard times, they're there to bring something about. And if you finish the, 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 the verse, let it finish its work so that you may be what? Mature and complete, not lacking anything. God's blessing in your life is that you would come to maturity and completeness. That's what, that's how, that's how uh, uh, John Wesley began to interpret perfection, is that, that, that it would be this idea of completeness, that it would be a, a full surrender followed by a completeness in our lives. Not always perfect in, in how we operated, but perfect in its, in its maturity and its completeness. I've got to be careful with this stuff. I'm trying really hard not to run into him, but I do every time. And this is what Joseph allowed to happen in his life. Even though he came about, it came about in this weird way. He was going a different direction, and, and, and God came to him through this angel and said, I'm sorry, th- you don't have to be afraid of this, though. You can walk this out in this different way. This is, this is from me. This is from God. Has God ever come to you and said, this, this, this situation's from me? Are you going to let me finish the work I've started through this? Because what I want for you is a maturity. I want from you is, is a completeness. This is going to teach you something. This is going to grow who you are. This is going to bring about more of me in you. Will you let it happen? Joseph was promised a son. And he was promised that he would be an adopted dad. And he let fit perseverance finish its work in him. Number two, and this is where we fit into the story. The world is promised God's son, right? He, we, we were promised what, what was eventually going to be the, the full benefit for uh, humanity lost and, 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 and broken in sin. The son will be named Jesus. The Greek version of that is the Greek version of, of the Hebrew word Joshua, the Hebrew name, which means something very specific. The Lord saves. He's going to be named the Lord saves. He's going to do something that no one else can do. The Lord saves. He says it right there because he will save his people from their sins. The next part of that verse helps us understand all this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son and they will call him Emmanuel. So your son He's going to save the world, and he's going to do it while he's with you. God will be with you. Emmanuel, God with us. And this people that he's referring to is not just referring to Israel. He's referring to humanity. And John 3.16 reminds us of that. For God so loved the world, not just Israel, that he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him will not perish but have everlasting life. The world is promised God's Son. God's Son, whose name will be the Lord saves. God's Son, who will save the world from their sins. Who takes His people that He came from and expands it into all of humanity, that whosoever will believe. This is the promise that we were given. This is where we come into this. I know a lot of politicians make promises to their own constituents to make their lives better. We're going to do, we're going to work for you. We're going to go and we're going to make things better in our district or our state or whatever it looks like. Sometimes they follow through and sometimes they don't, right? God promised to save the world in this way all the way back in Genesis. Did you know that? Genesis chapter 3 verse 15 is on the screen. It says, and I will put enmity or open hostility between you. He's talking to the serpent, right? Who is representative of of Satan, right? I will put enmity between you 
and the woman, and between your offspring and hers, and he will crush your head, and you will strike his heel. In other words, this is a messianic prophecy. This is, this is the beginning of hope. Right after the despair of sin enters the world, he immediately comes in and says, but there's hope, and I'm going to show you through how, we, how, the, how you interact with humanity here. In other words, you may think you're dealing a death blow, to her offspring, but her seed is coming for the keys to death, hell, and the grave, and he will deal the final death blow to you when he rises from the dead. That's what he promised. It was necessary that the, that the child who was promised would come to save us from our sins, and there were things that needed to happen in order for that to be achieved in, 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 in its fulfillment, for, for there to be victory and completeness. It's also a precursor to Jesus' final, I'm going to use a really mean word, annihilation, okay? His final annihilation of the evil instigator of sin's curse, which is Satan, right? When he returns, he is going to put him in his place for all of eternity, right? And so we anticipate his return. John Salhamer is quoted as saying, Even after they were cast away from God's protective care in the garden, God let it be known that this act of disobedience would not thwart his plan for humanity's blessing. A future seed would one day come and crush the head of the serpent. God makes promises and God keeps his promises. Amen? Amen. And as we see the whole world, uh, we see that the whole world was promised a son in order to save it. And we get the blessing of that. Finally, number three, Mary gave birth to the son, the son that was promised. Joseph followed the Lord's command. He let perseverance finish its work in him. Mary gives birth to a son. And as we read in verse 24 and 25, when he woke up, he did what the angel of the Lord had commanded him and took Mary home as his wife. But he did not consummate their marriage until he, she gave birth to a son. And he gave him the name Jesus. Tracking has become a real thing these days, right? Amazon will let you track UPS. We've, we've done tracking for a long time, but Amazon started to do this really fun thing, right? They'll tell you, your package is 10 stops away, right? Your package is five stops away. And it's wonderful when you see it's only a couple stops away, and hopefully you're home, right? And when it comes, when it comes to you just in that same time, you're like, okay, this is awesome, I love Amazon. When they don't come through, it's like, I hate them. Why do they always do this to me, right? We always go to the extremes with this stuff. It's so funny that, that, that this, it's frustrating when they pass your house or they don't see it. I remember when Domino's would, would, would deliver to me and, and I, would be, I would begin to track where their car was, right? If you have the app, you can track their car and it's this little car on the map. And I, w I would watch them and I would say, okay, Yep, this is my old, my old neighborhood. You could go the long way on the main road, or you could cut through where the pool was and go, I mean, it saves a guy like two minutes. I mean, who wouldn't want to save two minutes, right? So I'm thinking to myself, if he's a smart guy, he's going to go this way. Sure enough, oh, there, there went the car. But then something weird would happen because they never really understood where they were. At that pool, there's a roundabout. And they would never turn right. I don't know. All of a sudden, the car's pointing in the wrong direction. And, oh, there they are on the main road again. And it would just get all confusing, and I would lose two minutes. I'm like, man, it's not as hot now. I'm just kidding. No, I wouldn't do that. <laughs> you just lost part of your tip. No, I would never say that. No, but, for, <laughs> but, but, but tracking is, is, this, is this interesting thing. And Jesus arrives, and he arrives to complete the promise. And he, and he arrived on time, didn't he? just the right time while we were yet sinners. Christ died for us. Before he came to die, he was born at just the right time. These are what people call, in, in, in translation of the Greek in the New Testament, kairos moments. At just the right time, the, the word used in there is called kairos, which means a specific point in time, a, a moment in time. You have the chronos moments, the chronological, this is how it fits within the timeline, but these special moments. And at just the right time he arrived to complete not just the promise that he would be born, but he would come 
to save the people, his people, from their sins. That's what we see. And as Joe and the team, they come up, 1 John chapter 4, it reminds us of this. And I want you to look at this with me. It says, and we have seen, these, these, this, is, this is John who, who was there, right? We have seen and testify that the Father has sent His Son to be the Savior of the world. I love this. If anyone acknowledges that Jesus is the Son of God, God lives in them and they live in God, what do we get by, by, by believing and acknowledging that Jesus is who He said He was and He came to fulfill the promise and He came to save me from my sins? It says that you are now in God. You're not just saved from your sins, but you are now wrapped into the, the eternal nature of God Himself. You are in Him and He is in you through the Holy Spirit. John was talking about this communion we receive with Jesus. What a beautiful thing. And he says this, and so we know. How do we, how do we know? How do we know he says, this is how I know. This is a theme in John as he wrote these last few letters. We know and we rely on the love God has for us. That's what this whole story is about, right? He wants to remind you that this whole thing is because God loves you. He loves you. So we testify and we acknowledge, and those are key things, right? and us experiencing salvation. But throughout our lives, good circumstances and bad, where we're, if whether we're letting perseverance finish its work in us and we become mature or not, what we rely on is not our testimony and not just words that we say, but on the fact that God loves you. That's it. When Jesus came, as the promised son, it reminds you on something that you can take to the bank every time. For God so loved you and me that he gave his one and only son. He loves you. Would you pray with me today? What a gift you gave us, God. Fulfillment of a promise. The Lord who came to save. God with us. And Jesus, we can't ask for a better gift. I like gifts like the next person. We can't receive a better one. And we thank you today for fulfilling the promise and being who God the Father said you are. We love you today. Thank you for loving us more to be with us and to die for us. In Jesus' name, all God's people said, amen. amen. I like gifts like the next person. I think the fun in Christmas is watch is is the kids in Christmas, right? Uh, we we do the Santa Claus thing and filling the stockings and all of that's wonderful. We celebrate the birth of Jesus, though, so we invite you to do that Christmas Eve or Christmas Day or both. That's all good, right? But the son had to be had to do more than just be born. And so as we as we end today, he didn't tell us to remember his birth. He said to proclaim my death until I return, to proclaim the Lord's death. So what is the importance of the Son today? And I want to just walk through these as we end. The Son of Man, Jesus, died on the cross as a gift to us. Look at this, 69 times in the Synoptic Gospels, meaning the three that really flow together chronologically and make the most sense together. They'll pull them together and the, the things that were happening in those Gospels really line up well. Those synoptic ones, 69 times Jesus referred to himself as a son of man. Why? Why? Sometimes it was just a, a generic use of a term that just said, I, I'm one of you, in other words. I'm a human being just like you. His emphasis was on humanity and his humanity. God with us. He's here for you. The Son of Man died on the cross as a gift. Secondly, the Son of God, Jesus, rose from the dead. And He rose in power and authority and victory. Amen? And He was raised up and sits at the seat of victory and completeness at the right hand of God today until God the Father says, go and finish the work. 
and then he's the son of promise. Jesus, who will return again. So as you take this home today with you and you don't put a period on it, but maybe a comma, the question today is not do we believe in the birth of the son of Joseph and Mary. We can set our nativity scenes up and we can, we can, we can add a, a level of belief this year. But the real question is this, do you believe in the risen and returning son of God? If he promised, if he made promises and they were kept, he will come again. Do you believe in him? And how does Jesus, the son of intersect and affect your faith and lifestyle as you live in community? How does that work? If you want to talk about those things, we encourage you to do that beyond today. The answer to that question, do you believe in the risen and returning Son of God? That's, that answer is your salvation. Who do you believe Jesus is? And so today as we stand together, before we end, we're going to sing this song one more time together, and we are going to adore the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Would you stand? Let's do that together. He's worthy of our praise. Amen. So let's sing to him today.